morning, Church of the Living God out there in the great land of America. It is somehow like awkward here in Malaga, as you know. I'm saying good morning, and here is past 6 p.m. But nevertheless, that's the way it is until we enter the, uh, the, the, the promised land when Christ comes. Then we'll have the same time everywhere. Thank you so much, Pastor Kaura, for welcoming me in that um, um, beautiful speech. God bless you. I'm so happy that the Lord has given me this opportunity to be able to share with the saints of the living God out there in the U.S. from the word of God. As you have been told, the title of our sermon is The Little City. The Little City. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we pray that you speak yourself to all of us, that you draw us closer to the cross of Calvary. We pray that you increase our faith in Jesus' name. Amen. The little city. From special testimonies written in November, November 24, 1887, Ellen White writes, though earth was struck off from the continent of heaven and alienated from its communion, Jesus has connected it again with the sphere of glory. With this quotation, we pretty well tell that there was a time when this planet Earth was alienated or separated, as Ellen White calls it, from the continent of heaven, from our Father in heaven. Now, because this planet Earth was separated, then it needed a savior. Today, I'm reading from you a story told by King Solomon, written in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. The story says, there was a little city and a few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. So Solomon told this story and he says there was a little city and a few people lived in that little city. And there was a time when there came a great king and that king conquered this little city and oppressed the people, the few people that lived in that little city, troubled them, tortured them for quite a long time. And now Solomon says, then there was found a poor but wise man who delivered those people in that little city. But then the problem, the problem was no one remembered that same poor wise man who delivered them. Now, this parable of the little city has contradictory backgrounds. Theologians have suggested three probable historical foundations. Number one, a man by the name of Wright suggests that this story was a reference to deliverance of Abel Beth Marcha 
through the wisdom of a wise woman. This is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verses 15 to 22. Another man by the name of Gates says that it was some event not recorded in history, but well known to the public for whom the preacher wrote. Then another man by the name of Hitzik, he suggests that it was an incident which may have occurred in the siege of Dora by Antiochus the Great in 218 BC. But whatever the case, we can still draw lessons from the story. And how do we identify this city today? Fawcett says the little city is the church of God. The great king is Satan, the prince of hell and darkness. The poor wise man is the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to suggest that the little city is the planet Earth. I take the little city to mean our planet Earth, a tormented planet, a tortured planet, a planet in trouble. We are told that this planet Earth has a population of about 7.8 billion people. Scientists tell us that the sun is 1.3 million times bigger than our Earth. And they say it is 93 million miles away from the Earth. Its diameter is 864,000 miles. Jupiter, we are told, is 1,300 times bigger than this planet Earth. Uranus, scientists tell us that it is 14.5 times as massive as Earth. They also tell us that Neptune is 19 times as massive as Earth. Then I look to this planet Earth as a little city, a tormented city by the devil. Now, what happened? We read in the book of Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. When God created the earth, it was perfect. Everything was harmonious until the devil entered into a serpent and caused Adam and Eve to sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, they separated themselves from God, the source of life. The moment sin entered the world, death entered also. Yes, trouble entered this planet. Poverty entered the world. And that's why Paul tells us in Romans 5, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Yes, as a result of sin, death entered the world. As a result of sin, there is war. Man killing fellow man. There is segregation and tribalism and racism in the world as a result of sin. Yes, there are numerous types of diseases on earth. Friends, this is a tormented and a permanent planet conquered by the devil. And that's why Paul again writes in Romans 8, verse 22. He writes, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. 
the whole world is groaning. I'm using King James Version. So Paul says, the whole world groaneth. Everybody is complaining. There is weeping, there is crying in all corners of the earth. There is death everywhere. There are numerous diseases and pandemics. Now we are tormented and tortured by this pandemic, COVID-19. The wise people are unwise now. The rich look like poor people now because of the COVID pandemic. This is a tormented planet. Friends, it needed a savior. It needed a savior to save this planet from complete extinction from the face of our loving father. So the whole creation is groaning according to Paul. Every creature is groaning. Flowers wither, trees wither, and people die, animals die. It's a tormented planet that needed a savior. Yes, we know because of sin and sin is everywhere. In the theology, we see man has the propensity to sin. Or in other words, a person is always leaning towards sin because sin is in us, is outside us, is everywhere, surrounding us. We need a savior. So man has the propensity to sin. In other words, is leaning towards sin. And even Ellen White, in Ministry of Healing, page 451, she writes, sin is a tremendous evil. Through sin, the whole human organism is deranged. The mind is perverted. The imagination is corrupt. Sin has, a, has degraded the facilities of the soul. Temptations from without find an answering cord within the heart. And the feet turn imperceptibly toward evil. So according to Ellen White, she says here that uh, a human being has the sin itself finds an answering code in us. There is a network to sin, network of sin within us, within every human being. And that is why Paul complained in Romans 7, verses 15 to 20. He said, the good that I want to do, I fail to do. But the bad that I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. Then he continued and said, but when I am doing that which is bad, it's not me doing it. But the sin that is inside me is the one that makes me to sin. Now, that is why we're saying man has the propensity to sin. Sometimes we want to do the good things that please our God, but we find ourselves falling into sin time and again. Why? Because there is an answering call to sin within us. That is why when you hold an evangelistic campaign, you actually plead with people to come. But let's say there is some noise somewhere, people are fighting, and some people are shouting, oh, it's here, they're fighting. You find people leaving their offices, rushing to the scene. They will come in large numbers without even enticing them, without even pleading with them, but where? 
evil is, people will rush there. And when you are preaching, people won't want to come. Why will they rush where there is some bad thing happen, happening? It's because there is an answering code to sin within us. But there is no answering code to good things, to the things of God. Evil has deranged us, according to Ellen White. Therefore, we needed a savior. We really indeed need a savior. And so the Bible has taught us the story of a little city that was conquered and besieged by the ruthless king. And this king now to me is certain himself, no any other than the devil himself. After causing Adam and Eve to sin, then he took charge of this planet Earth. He became the king of this planet Earth and he has been torturing people for over nearly 6,000 years now, causing havoc in this planet. There is war in many countries. We had First World War, and then we had Second World War. We heard even the massacre of the Jews by Holocaust. Yes, we know there, have been, there has been evil happening in this planet to this day, and it will never stop until Jesus comes. Yes, man hurting fellow man, the Tutsis and the, the Hutus killing each other, tribal against tribe. Now, friends, this planet is in a chaos. It is in a chaotic situation. It needed a savior. But the good news is, in verse 15 of Ecclesiastes 9, Bible told us, it says, now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Amen. Yes, there was found a poor but wise man who delivered the city, who delivered the people, who saved the people from this ruthless king. This poor but wise man is no other than Jesus Christ to me. That poor wise man, Jesus Christ. Now listen, the Bible says there was found in that city a poor but wise man. There was found. It means he was not there, but he came because there was found. He came. So Jesus came from the farm to this planet Earth to save humanity from sin and from death, even eternal death. Jesus came and he took the form of the poorest person to save even the poorest. So even the poorest people have access to salvation. There is no segregation. Jesus, praise God, has embraced every soul, black and white, rich and poor, king and subordinates. Everybody has access to salvation. How much can we thank our Lord Jesus Christ? How much? There is no way we can thank Jesus enough. So there was found a poor but wise man. Let's go a little bit deeper. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and, and 7 to 8, Paul writes, and I read in your hearing, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, but made himself 
of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross praise god so paul says let this mind be in you which was also in christ that even though he was god he was in the likeness of god he was god himself he took the form of a man of a human being of a slave he just chose to become man so that he would be able to dwell among men among people so that he should feel the way we feel taste our sufferings have a thirst of our problems he came and took a form of a, a servant a human being and then he remained faithful faithful to the cause which of which he came here for he was faithful unto death even the death of the cross on the cross and he died not for himself but for us all and that's why jesus himself said in luke 19 verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost so he came to seek and save that which was lost who was lost it's all of us we were lost from the presence of our father separated from god by sin and when we were separated from god it meant that we were separated from life even eternal life and we were dead as it were so jesus came to save us and to give us eternal life but then the bible says let me remind you the bible has told us that this savior was poor a poor but wise man Jesus spoke of his poverty when a certain man came to him and this is in is recorded in Matthew chapter 8 verse 20 a scribe came to Jesus and said lord i will follow you wherever you go and Jesus responded and i read the response in your hearing in Matthew 8 verse 20 and Jesus said unto him the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests but the son of man has not where to lay his head this man said lord i'll follow you wherever you go and Jesus said foxes have their holes birds of the air have their nests but the son of man has no way to lay his head doesn't have even a pillow so he took the form of a poor person he came as a poor man remember he was born even his birth he was born in a manger i read somewhere about the manger Listen let me share with you what i read Someone wrote that when Jesus was born was born in the shadows of death for that purpose came he to die for us and so when he, the bible says he was born in a manger we are told according to where i read that the manger was a type 
of a box. First, maybe before I talk of a manger, that the writer say, wrote and said that uh, the baby Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes according to King James Version. The baby Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem not to give birth to Jesus. They went there because there was a census. But time for Jesus to be born came when they were still there in Bethlehem. And so what happened, according to Jewish culture, in those days, the writer said, when a person died, he had to be buried or she had to be buried the same day. So when people were going on an errand, on a trip, they used to carry clothes in case they die there because they have to be buried the same day. They need a cloth to have their bodies wrapped in. And those clothes were called swaddling cloths. Now, Joseph and Mary took those clothes for that purpose, going to Bethlehem. And when Jesus was born, they had no other clothes. They took those swaddling clothes and wrapped Jesus because he was born in the shadows of death. And then he was put in a manger. The writer say, a manger was kind of a box and they used to put some feed for the cattle in that box, which was called a manger. And it signifies somehow like a grave. So baby Jesus was put there. He was born in the shadows of death because for that purpose, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. But then the Bible told us or tells us that that poor wise man saved the people in the little city by his wisdom. I can't say much about the wisdom of God. It's too broad. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 to 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 to 24. I will not finish all those verses to, in, to read in your hearing. I will just select a few. Let me read in verse 20. Paul says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by um, wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. I could continue reading. So the wisdom of God or the foolishness of God according to Paul is wiser than the wisdom of men. Let me tell you something. Paul says, God designed that through this foolishness of preaching, people should be saved. It looks foolish to be preaching, to be shouting and speaking. It looks foolish. When you stand in front of people preaching like I'm doing, then I become a fool. But I praise God because through this foolishness of preaching, it is the wisdom of God to save human beings. And so we praise God for that. And 
God, God's wisdom is great, so great. Think about Jesus. When you talk about Jesus, when you look at Jesus, you are looking at the wisdom of God. The greatest science of all that God came to be a human being. The greatest science is the incarnation of God into a human being. This baffles us and it baffles the devil himself. But that's the wisdom of God. Now, through his wisdom, he saved the city. Through his wisdom, Jesus saved all of us from the eternal death and from sin. Where is the wisdom? When someone is fighting you or is beating you and you don't revenge, you don't retaliate, that is wisdom. People spat at him when he was arrested in the garden of Gethsemane. People beat him, but he never fought back. That is wisdom. Actually, Aaron White tells us that in the garden of Gethsemane, the angels were ready. Even Jesus himself said it. I could ask the Father, I could send angels to rescue me. It was possible to do that. But he did not want to revenge. That is wisdom. When people are shouting at you and you choose to be silent, that is wisdom. When you talk too much, you are unwise. So people shouted at Jesus, jeered him, but he remained quiet. That is wisdom. And then when you pray for your enemies, that is wisdom. On the cross, Jesus asked the Father, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. That was wisdom. And then when people are oppressing you and you remain calm, that is wisdom. So through his wisdom, he delivered us from sin. He saved mankind from sin. Even Jesus himself said in John 12, I like this text, John 12 verses 31 to 32. Now, Jesus now says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Hallelujah. He said, when he was about, when his days were close to die for us, then he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now shall that ruthless king, the devil himself, be cast out. Satan will be displaced. And he said, and now, and when I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. When I be lifted up on the cross, I, as it were, he was saying, I will produce a magnetic force and I will draw all people to myself. Where are the people? Where were the people? The people were in the camp of the devil. The people were with the devil. The people were dying with the devil. And so Jesus says, when I be lifted up, when I'm crucified, I'll draw all people to myself. That is what he did. And so, Jim McGagan wrote, and I quote, the cross speaks louder than our sin. Where sin shouts, the cross thunders. Where sin whispers its lies and confuses us, the cross heralds its truth 
and drives away the darkness. Is God soft on sin? The cross shouts, no. Is God soft on sinners? The Bible says, yes. So God is lenient to people, lenient to sinners. He wants to save us all. Someone has observed in Christ, we have a love that can never be fathomed, a life that can never die, a peace that can never be understood, a rest that can never be disturbed, a joy that can never be diminished, a hope that can never be disappointed, a glory that can never be clouded, a light that can never be darkened, and a spiritual resource that can never be exhausted. That is in Jesus. So we need to praise our Lord Jesus. He saved us from sin. But the problem, the problem we read, yet no man remembered that same poor man. That is us. No man remembered that same poor man. First Corinthians verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 24, Paul writes, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, so that we do that in remembrance of him. No man remembered that same poor wise man. That's sad. Let me tell you, church of the living God. It's too sad. After Jesus has paid the price for our ransom, Planet Earth, people in this world have, have forgotten about Jesus. The world is more and more forgetting about Jesus. How much can I thank my Lord? Nevertheless, even though the world is forgetting Jesus, we can choose to continue remaining in Jesus. I have made up my mind that I'll follow Jesus all the way until I'll breathe my last. Because I can't thank him enough. I know I was a boxer one time. Jesus saved me from that. Today, I'm boxing the devil. I'm preaching the gospel. I know I was deep into sin. But Jesus saved me. As it were, I was dead, but now I'm alive. I say thank you, Jesus, for saving my life. We can't thank Jesus enough. We hopeless creatures, now we have hope in Jesus because he died for us. There are some people that worship their wealth. When they are rich, they think they don't need Jesus. When they are rich, they think they don't need God. When they are rich, they think they don't need to worship God. It's not long from them. They will know that this earth belongs to God when Jesus will be appearing in the clouds of heaven. We can't worship our wealth. Let's worship our God. I read somewhere about this rich man, a billionaire, by the name of Antonio Vieira Montero, owner of Santander Bank, which is the largest in Spain and Portugal. This man died of COVID-19 at the age of 73. His daughter, Rita Montero, recovered from the same pandemic, COVID-19. And after the death of her father, she said, and I quote, we are a billionaire family, but my father 
died alone and suffocated, looking for something free, which is air. The money stayed at home. Sad. Rita said, we are coming. I'm coming from a billionaire family. We have the money, as it were. But my father died looking for something free, which is air. God gives us air for free. Thank God if you are able to breathe. He died looking for something free. And Rita says, but the man stayed at home. Man will never save us. Even when we are rich, let us remain in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue worshiping our Lord, for he is the only one who can give us life, even life eternal. At one time, Jesus asked in Luke 18, verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? He left this unanswered question. When the Son of Man will come, shall he find faith on the earth? When he asked this question, it was because he foresaw that time will come when people will begin to forget him, will begin to forget Jesus. After paying that great price on the cross of Calvary to save us, the world will forget him. The faith will not be there. But church of the living God, right there in the U.S. And everybody listening to me now, let us make it our choice to remain faithful to Jesus and thank him for the death he died on the cross, the price he paid for us. If we have this hope, it's because of his death on the cross. And it is in Jesus that we have this faith. It is Jesus who gives us this hope. It is in Jesus. And so we say, thank you, Jesus. He came to this little city, planet Earth, found this ruthless king, the devil himself, and conquered him, defeated him on the cross, and shouted the shout of victory. It is finished. And I praise God because he conquered the devil. Now we are liberated. Now we are free. Now we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Now we have this hope. Now we have this faith in Jesus. Now we know where we are going. Now we know in whom we believe. Now we know that the Lord is about to come. When he asked, shall he find faith when he comes? We can say, yes, at least you find me remaining in the faith. He'll find you in faith. And we should not give up. Never give up the faith. See the signs of the times taking place everywhere. The world as it were is saying bye-bye. The world is coming to an end. Today, the bad is legalized. Evil is legalized. The truth is rejected. More and more people are leaving Jesus Christ, are giving up faith. I have read even some pastors are leaving the faith. Others, I read about a Seventh-day pastor in the United States of America right there left the church and joined atheism and he has become or became an atheist. He no longer believes in God. So many people will be giving up the faith. But you and I, let us remain faithful. 
we can't thank Jesus enough for his days on Calvary. Today we are free. Today we have this hope. We know where we are going. We know in whom we believe. Let people reject Jesus. Let the world run away from Jesus. We shall remain faithful to him until we breathe our last. And now I say, thank, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thanks to cover me. Because I was a sinner, now I'm a child of God. Thanks to cover me. Because I was dead in sin, but now I'm alive in Jesus. Thanks to cover me. Because I didn't have hope, but now I have this hope to live again when Jesus comes. Thanks to cover me. Because I was blind to the truth, biblical truth, but now I see, I see through the portals of heaven and see the glory is there. I want to be there. Thanks to cover me. Because I didn't know I did not know the future, what it heard for me. But now I know that my Lord is coming again. Thanks to cover me. Because, yes, I was deep into the mud, but Jesus lifted me up from the mud of sin and cleansed me with his own blood. Thanks to cover me. Because I was the enemy of the truth and of the Father, our Heavenly Father. But now, today, I am a friend of the Father in heaven. Thanks to cover him. I say now, yes, I was poor in spiritual things, but now I'm rich in the word of God. Thanks to cover him. I did have this hope of resurrection. But now I know when I die, when he comes, I shall resurrect again. Thanks to cover me. My friends, I needed a savior. But now I have a savior. Thanks to cover me. Now I see the truth as it is outlined in the Bible, thanks to cover him. I see people running away from Jesus, and I say I'll follow him to the end because I've seen the light on the cross of Calvary. Thanks to cover him. I was the child of the devil, but now I am a child of God. Thanks to cover him. I did not have friends in Christ, but now I have friends in Christ. I have a family called the Church of the Living God. Thanks to Calvary. Now I am able to be preaching to people thousands and thousands of kilometers away. Thanks to Calvary. So Church of the Living God out there, this little city, planet Earth, was delivered from sin by Jesus Christ. And yet, people have forgotten about Jesus. And I tell you, the same Jesus they are forgetting is coming again very soon. Signs of the times are everywhere. Now it's time that we need to wake up and preach, and preach, even preach more, until Jesus comes again. And I know I don't have many more days to live. But one thing I know, I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. This planet is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I say, Lord, take my heart. Keep it safe in your hands. Take my life and keep my life in your hands. But when you come again, I want to be with you in heaven. Is that your prayer? Let me see your hands and let us pray. Father God in heaven. We want to thank you so much for the privilege of hearing your word, listening to your word. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you because Christ died for us and saved us on the cross. 
this planet Earth, the little city, was delivered by wisdom. Yes, by the power of Jesus Christ. And now, even though people are forgetting about our Savior, Jesus Christ, look at our hands. We are determined not to forget you, but to follow you to the end of this world and even the end of our lives. I pray for your church in America, the people that have listened to this message. I pray they are in a far country, but our God, you are everywhere. You are omnipresent. Let them feel your presence. I pray that you bless each one of them. Give them grace. Give them the resources that they need to survive in a foreign land. I pray that you give them good health. Save them and protect them even from this pandemic that is tormenting us. We thank you for those who have already been healed by your power. May your name be praised forever. I pray for your grace to be them, to be with them. I pray that your salvation will be complete in their lives. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon your people in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.